Hello, yes, this is Peter, Peter Cox, Agent P in Latopia, welcoming you to pop-up submissions for the 4th of November. And we're streaming live on Facebook, Twitch, and of course YouTube right now. Recordings will be available afterwards of this extraordinary event. Pop-up submissions is that thing that, uh, that <laughs> happens on the internet uh, just about every week um, when we, we take you to the dark heart of the submission process. If you've ever sent a manuscript to a publisher, or indeed someone like me, an agent, this is what happens when he gets there. Never been done before. On today's pop-ups, we've got adult fiction from Louise, YA urban fantasy from Rick, children's illustrated fiction from Katie, contemporary fiction from Kieran, fantasy from Heather, and YA from Karen. And I should tell you, for those of a sensitive disposition, uh, we've got some adult themes on uh, the show today, together with um, an interesting selection of fairly salty language in some of the submissions, so you have been warned. Um, all this together with an absolutely fabulous panel of voice artists. I was actually talking to a publisher, having lunch with a publisher. We always do, we have lunch, that's what publishing is about, really. Um, and talking about our amazing voice panel. And they are so good that actually, if all you do is listen then it's quite difficult, really quite difficult, to evaluate the submissions. They are that good. They can make an indifferent submission sound really good. So really very grateful to all our voice artists today and on every pop-up submission. Um, and, of course, the wit and uncommon wisdom of the Latopia chat room denizens. Should we say hello to them? There they are, all lining up in a row, nice and neat. Let's also say hello to Ali. Epic listener, Hello. you are. Hi, how are you, Ali? Absolutely fine, thank you very much. So That's thrilled good. to be here again. It's good to. <laughs> I'm loving people, our background. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. people are already criticising my shirt. So <laughs> oh, nothing, come on, it's very not, jolly. Well, I just felt like being cheered up, you know. Incidentally, <laughs> before I say anything else, I, I meant to say it at the beginning and haven't said Thank you so much to everyone who has sent uh, good wishes to Peggy, my writing partner and indeed life partner. Um for um you know she had a really unpleasant accident in baker street um about 10 days ago and um she's out of hospital had a long operation um as you would expect she's feeling pretty ropey and will be for a few weeks time but the healing the healing has started and thank you so much and that's why we had to cancel last week's show actually because <clears throat> it's all emergency and uh blues and twos and everything so thank you so much for everyone um, in, inside Latopia who's um who said something nice and send their, their good wishes. It's a nice place, Latopia. Very nice place. We want to get to know you a little bit better, Ali, right now. Um, <laughs> and I think one of the most penetrating questions we, we can ask these days, and you've got to be honest here, right, mm. is what favourite song of yours would you be otherwise too embarrassed to tell us about? <laughs> It, it's deeply embarrassing, actually. You've touched a you've touched a raw nerve. It's a, a little tune, <laughs> um, which is "Bump the Elephant." It, it was a theme tune for a children's program, and I absolutely love "Bump the Elephant." And I'm wandering around and humming along to it. And uh, I've the never kids all think I'm I mean, at the risk of in you gross copyright heard? infringement. No, oh. at the risk of gross copyright infringement. Please give us a little selection from "Bump the Elephant." Oh no. <laughs> Come on, you've As got a special to. treat. I won't sing. <laughs> I won't sing from the elephant. <laughs> Just hum the first no, bar. Birdie sings the sweetest song. Bump the elephant isn't quite as elegant, so it carries on. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Ellie, it's for very that. jolly. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Okay. Oh, you'll love it. Look it up. You, you'll love it. Um, you'll like uh, it. This, there is a real danger. I, I, I could actually. Um, I don't know if you can you can trump that. Get it, Amber? Can you trump that? 
I, I, I don't know. Probably. I, I like, um, I like Dancing Queen by ABBA. Okay, I think it's yeah. embarrassing enough just to like ABBA. But well, the there you go. I, I like. mean, you know what? They're so old now <laughs> that it's actually becoming cool again. It's like all, oh, all the really okay. crap, crap sort of rip-off imitative bands of the 60s and 70s have actually become cool now. So, you, well, know, you just got to wait was, long enough. It was... It's like shirts like this, basically. <laughs> um, yeah, it was bound to happen eventually. I knew I'd be cool someday. <laughs> yes. Yes, imminently so. Um, oh, that's very good indeed. I think we should move straight on to our first submission. Yeah, and Nikki says in the chat room, it sounds like an earworm. I'm very much frightened it is, and I'm frightened I cannot get bump the elephant out of my head now. Let's see if this, if this submission from Louise has exactly the same effect, as she hopes it does, and we hope it does too. It's called Don't Keep Me Waiting. Um, I should tell you it is, it's got adult themes. Adult themes, so be prepared. Um, let's have a look at um, Louise's blurb. From debut writer Louise Martin comes a new adult novel, Don't Keep Me Waiting. 18-year-old Melanie Hall wakes up cuffed to a bed frame in a cell naked. The last thing she remembers is drinking coffee in a hotel room. After days of physical, sexual and psychological abuse, Mel's mind is made up. She has to escape. <laughs> you think so? One girl has already been murdered and she's scared. She may be next. Let me tell you a little bit about Louise. She says when she's born, I'm not going to tell you that I'm too much of a gentleman. Um, debut no novelist, currently a French and Spanish teacher, Writes in her spare time. Previously, she spent six years on various holiday parks in the UK. It's always good experience, that, I think. Um, as both a coat-type entertainer, that's like a red coat, um, and an entertainment's manager. She's had some French books published by Linguascope, and most recently, Les Problèmes Logiques et Latéraux, by Brilliant Publications. She looks forward to writing the sequel to her first novel. So let's uh, not hang around anymore, and let's hear... 700 words, read fabulously, as always, by Emily. Don't Keep Me Waiting, read by Emily. Chapter 1, Saturday, 7th of November, evening. I can't remember how I got here, lying on my back, cuffed to a black metal bed, frame naked. All I know is that I'm scared. My mouth and lips are dry and my head is throbbing. I can't move. My hands are cuffed above my head and my ankles are cuffed to the base of the bed frame. It's pitch dark in here. I can't see anything. Where the hell am I? My heart begins to race as I begin to panic. I yank on the handcuffs in the hope that they will release so I can sit up, but they don't. Instead, they bite into my wrists. Help! I try to shout, but it comes out as a squeak. I try again. Help! My effort is louder this time, but it still doesn't qualify as a shout. Is anyone there? Help me, I cry. A few seconds pass, and then my cries are answered. The lights snap on. I close my eyes as the light is intense, and then I struggle to open them. I'm desperate to see my surroundings, and more importantly, who has turned on the light. Has someone been here with me all the time, watching me? A shiver runs down my spine. Finally, you're awake, says a familiar voice. It takes me a few seconds to register whose voice it is. You've been out of it for a couple of days, so you're probably feeling a bit groggy, he continues. Although my vision is blurry, I can make out the figure of Mick Denton towering over me. He sits down on the bed beside me. I'm going to unlock your, unlock your handcuffs so you can sit up, but if you lash out, I will put them back on. Do you understand? I don't answer. I just stare up at him, waiting for him to tell me that this is all a big joke. But he doesn't smile. His face hardens as he shouts at me, Do you understand? Yes, I reply urgently. It's beginning to dawn on me that I'm his prisoner. He unlocks the handcuffs and removes them from my wrists, but leaves them dangling on the bed frame. Sit up, he commands. I obey instantly. The room swims, so I close my eyes to give my brain time to adjust. When I open my eyes, Mick is offering me a white, plastic cup. I expect you're thirsty. I cover my breasts with my right arm and take the cup with my left hand. I look inside it suspiciously. It's only water, 
Mick reassures me. I gulp it down. More, he offers, holding out a litre bottle of water. I nod so he refills the cup. I've downed it by the time he's replaced the cap and placed the bottle on the bedside table next to the red lamp. Where am I? I dare to ask. This is your room. No, I mean, what is this building? Are we still in Oswestry? This building is my sex school, and no, you're not in Oswestry anymore. So where the hell am I? Don't you dare speak to me like that, Melanie, or you will feel the back of my hand. I'm shocked. How could I have got him so wrong? I thought he was a charming man when I first met him. What do you mean by a sex school? I ask, even though I didn't really want to hear the answer. During the day, you'll attend classes where you'll be taught a range of subjects from history to maths. Why? To keep you busy. But I've already done all my schooling. Don't answer me back, Melanie. I've already warned you what'll happen if you piss me off. I swallow hard. At night, you will work as a prostitute to pay for your board and lodgings. I don't want to work as a prostitute. I want to go home. Mick stands up. You're not going anywhere, sweetheart. You wanted a job abroad, so that's what I'm giving you. The word sweetheart makes me cringe. I recall when he first phoned me and called me sweetheart. Then it made me so happy. Okay, so I just had a realisation during that, because I did actually those things, the school, history, maths and stuff. I must have gone to sex school without actually knowing it, (laughs) which is amazing, right? Um, are we still in Oswestry, Toto? That's what I want to know. Mm. Clearly we not. Oswestry, for those who don't know, it's a sort of March areas town on the A5, and uh, we probably left Oswestry some time ago. Um, Ali, um, I'm a bit out of my depth of this. I've never done um, books in this category before. I think there is a healthy market, if that's the right expression. Um, what's your first reaction to that? Um, I thought, that, I mean, it was quite reasonably pacey. Um, they used um, short sort of punchy sentences to get some action rolling. Yeah. I thought his character was shown well in his dialogue. He, he did come across, you, you very much had an idea of what he was like by the time he'd finished speaking. I, I thought her dialogue was a little odd in response to what he said. Um, you know, something like calmly saying, I don't want to work as a prostitute. <laughs> you know, it seems, yeah, I don't enough. know, I it just it felt it, it not quite real. Um, but no, and I thought also the there was a reason about the backstory fed in, you know, so we did now want to know how she'd ended up there, what was going to happen next, you know, um, and we did feel threatened. So okay. no, I thought it was, it was so well it's, put together. It's all, it's, I mean, the prostitute stuff, yeah, fair enough, but it's repeating all that history and maths during the day that I really wouldn't want. <laughs> Um, personally, but then, I mean, I'm not likely to get kidnapped in Oswestry, I don't imagine. Um, Amber, first reactions there. Uh, th- my first reaction, uh, that it was missing something for the expectations of, of the genre. And if I, if I understand right, maybe I th- it's missing a reason why she would ever... Um, I think it's erotica. Did I misunderstand? Is, is she? Anyway, I, I think it's missing one of the elements that um, that the genre would usually have, it's, which is if she's going to go to a school, that there has to be something in it for her. It's not well, a lot of pain and enormous <laughs> amounts of history and maths. Well, and a pretty dodgy job in the evening. Into, uh, into she doesn't seem to be into it at the moment, you know. <laughs> and then she knows that she knows the guy, but so if she knows the guy, and it's not a whole captor, whole mystery where who's captured me and why? Why do they have me here? If it's not that, which can be compelling, then what about this? How does she know the guy? Maybe I missed that too. How does yeah. she know the guy, and, and what about him? Is why did he pick her and and all yeah. all that stuff seems to be maybe it can't be it probably can't be put into seven hundred words but there just seems to be something missing yeah in it is it uh, did it hook you though I mean seven hundred words where well, you want to know if, if there's enough there to keep oh, people going would you would you uh, disengage or turn I the would, page I would I would I guess I would go a little I would maybe read a little, a little further. further just to be curious to see if if okay. yeah just to just to see I would I so, I thought the writing was good mostly I I did. I think the writing was pretty good. Um, maybe a few logistical things that 
as far as the cuffs and everything, they didn't seem quite right. But yeah, I thought it was pretty good writing. Okay. So, and, um, and it was compelling. The, um, I mean, I, I, I don't know, really. I mean, publishing tends to, even though, you know, Fifty Shades, the whole Fifty Shades thing has surely taught us, taught us a lesson or two, actually, about not, um, not ignoring this genre at all. Um, publishing tends to treat it very separately. Let me tell you a little story. Some years ago, and this is quite a few years ago, actually, when Virgin Books, oddly enough, they oddly enough named Virgin Books, um, were an independent company. Now they're an imprint of uh, Penguin Random House. When they were independent, they had some rather nice offices, actually, quite flash offices, just above the River Cafe here in London. So it was always a great treat to go out to have a meeting there because usually it'd be right about lunchtime and they used to get a discount in the restaurant as well, which is fabulous. I still remember Death by Chocolate, but I digress. So um, I had a little tour around Virgin Books and they said, uh, at the end of the tour, over there, that's some <clears throat> black lace. And what do you mean? Oh, it's, there's one guy basically in a corner office working away and... It was an imprint that generated almost all their profits, one or two people. But it was still curiously segregated from the rest of the, you know, proper publishing world. So I suspect there is a bit of um, inverted snobbery, um, or not inverted, actually. So there still is quite a lot of snobbery um, about this genre. Having said that, it's nothing that I personally would do. So... I can't, I can't really express too much of a professional comment here. I'm always a bit uneasy about the market for books that um, specialise in sort of female humiliation, actually. You do wonder who, who buys them and what they get out of it. Um, am I right to wonder, do you think? Anybody? Well, if you didn't, idea. you wouldn't be. Mm. <laughs> it's probably good that you it's still, good that, you still that, you do. that you do. What It's... We should wonder, I think. Even mm. if, I mean, even if you, even if you're someone who finds it interesting, of course you should wonder. That's part of the human experience, I think. Right? Yeah. I guess it depends also how it pans out. If she turns out to be some fierce female who, you know, gets her comeuppance, then oh, I see. You know, <laughs> it may be a different okay. story as it were. Then it's oh, well, and then suddenly it's absolutely fun. <laughs> How interesting. No, but it wow. does give it a different twist at the end of it, doesn't it? Go so. on, talk about flexible morality there. All right, so guys, we have mm -hmm. to uh, take a decision on, on Louise's manuscript here. Um, I'm going to ask you, Amber, if you were in the hot uh, hot seat, what would you do? Oh, a near miss, actually. Near okay. A near miss. And Ali? Uh, it, it's not my cup of tea, so it's in some ways slightly difficult to judge it. Um, I, I think um, if I read that genre, then would I call it a near miss? I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I yeah. think it's I think it's reasonable. Yeah, I call it a near miss. So, uh, okay. so it's nearly my cup of tea. Yeah, I would uh, say too. It's not my it's not my <laughs> not cup my of tea. Miss. It's um I've never really done a book in this area. I say really because there was an interesting book once, but although it was it was true. It was, uh, was non-fiction about an anonymous politician who was addicted to a number of interesting hobbies. <laughs> but um, no, that, that, was, that was real life. That wasn't escapism or fantasy. Um, so it's not an area I personally know. Um, it's not my cup of tea. It is very much genre writing. And the rule with everything that's kind of a genre is that it will, you know, as long as it's good enough, it'll sell acceptably well into the genre but to, to break out of the genre there's got to be some extraordinary added ingredient somewhere i'm not sure what that is louise um so to get a sort of a general publisher's attention i think you'd have to have to include that best i can do guys thank you louise we move on <laughs> Yeah, this is Gnosis. I like the title, actually. It's a cool title, isn't it? Uh, this is from Rick Harakol, indeed, or who I think is hanging around in the chat room there somewhere. Rick, are you not? Make yourself known, sir. Say hello. Uh, why a open fantasy? Let me tell you um, about the, the blurb here. Psychics, government conspiracies, and dangerous criminals swirl like a summer storm around 17-year-old parkour enthusiast Samantha Black. When a series of crushing headaches 
lands Sam in the hospital, she wakes to an imaginary voice in her head, Alexander, an adorable ten-year-old who claims to be a telepath. The doctors think Sam's brain was damaged after a stroke, but they're wrong. Alexander isn't imaginary. He's a sentient virus, and the government knows about him. After all, they created him. Hello, Rick. Good to have you there, mate. Absolutely. Uh, let me tell the world about you, because um, you've had an interesting, varied uh, career there. You're a veteran of the video games industry. Cool. Um, 30 year career, you've been a programmer or award winning game designer. Interesting to, uh, to ponder the similarities, I think, between games design and uh, plot structure and the differences too. Uh, an award winning game designer, producer working on titles like Madden Football and Ultima Online. Mm, big ones. He once studied chess with a Russian grandmaster, has read over a thousand history books. Cool. Uh, and even briefly served as an elected official. You teach a course on creative thinking for a video game school, and you've written a book on video game development, maintain a blog, co-author papers with several PhDs on a variety of subjects. And I think we can probably... Yes, we can. You can share everyone on your website. Coolest thing to do if you want to um, read more about Rick is just to go to his website, rickhallauthor.com. Yes. So now... Um, with apologies in advance, because I know um, your excellent reader, Katie Allen, did not pronounce parkour correctly. Katie, I'll speak to you afterwards about that. Uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's see the first 700 words. Gnosis, read by Katie Allen. Gnosis, read by Katie Allen. I was six months shy of 18 when I realized my first major truth, life is not a trust fall exercise. It's not a team building seminar when you can pretend to fall and your partner will catch you. In the real world, you're just gonna crack your skull on the pavement. As with most things, I had to learn that the hard way. When someone murdered my dad last month, a small army of good Samaritans from child welfare descended on me like flies on a garbage can. They forced me into foster care because my mum had run off with some other man when I was seven and with dad gone, they decided I needed guidance. I told them I didn't need help, but they wouldn't listen. They didn't approve of a teenage girl who practiced urban freestyle running where you're only considered good if you can run at least two steps up a wall and precision jump from a second story roof. It's a legit sport and I've been practicing for five years. It's called Parker. The state called it self-destructive behavior. As a result, they shoved me into an upscale urban hellhole. Life with John and Tammy Borden lasted exactly a week before I ran away. When I left, I stole $300 from the plastic bottle they kept inside the toilet's water tank. That's where they hid the emergency money. In my defense, the circumstances qualified as an emergency. Six months of yuppie-induced tyranny wouldn't have killed me, but the same city officials who stuffed me into a house with two strangers didn't give a damn about investigating Dad's murder. Dad was a cop. His death deserve justice and Frank Walcott, the investigating officer, had made zero progress. That's why it was an emergency. It's why I stole the money, bought a Teledyne 500 transmitter and planted it in Walcott's squad car. Things didn't go as planned. The Teledyne had a range of half a mile, which meant I had to stay close to it. Uh, too close, it turns out. Walcott realised I was stalking him, found the bug and arrested me. Now I sat in a hard wooden chair listening to him complain as he filed the arrest report. I rattled the shackles on my wrists, linked by a chain that looped through a metal bracket at the edge of the table. The sharp sound made me wince. For the past few weeks, sporadic headaches had been weighing me down. The one pounding in my brain now was epic but asking for an aspirin would be a waste of time. Compassion wasn't high on Walcott's priority list. From across the crowded squad room, Officer Bobby Kellogg, good-natured cop who Dad always spoke well of, rolled his eyes and navigated toward us. 
lugging a cardboard evidence box. Thunking the box onto the table, Bobby shook his head at Walcott. Seriously, Frank, shackles? His Pennsylvania twang made him sound like a hick, a cute but clueless country boy. Yeah, Walcott grumbled, pecking at the keyboard to try to log the arrest report with a lame, two-fingered typing style. Been thinking about gagging her too. Bobby ran a hand through his hair and dragged a chair next to me. Sammy, what do you do to Frank? I looked at the floor, ashamed to meet his sympathetic gaze. Uh, my temper had gotten the best of me, but honestly, Frank Walcott could push anyone's buttons. All he had to do was open his mouth. She sucker punched me, Walcott said, shoving the keyboard aside and rooting through the evidence box. He tossed my backpack onto the table, along with my phone, the Teledyne transmitter and Dad's badge, the only keepsake I cared about. I rattled my chains again. Oh, grow a pair, Walcott. You call my dad dirty, so you got what you deserved. Yeah? Mm, we'll see who gets what they deserve, he said. Wiretapping, assaulting a cop. You're looking at jail time, sweetheart. Too bad your drug-dealing daddy's dead. You could have shared a cell with him. When he chuckled, I swear, if I hadn't been shackled, I'd have hit him again. The grunting noises he made while rooting through my things reminded me of a dog snuffling through garbage. After tossing aside some clothes, his attention landed on a pair of pink panties. Dangling them at arm's length, he smirked. Uh-oh. It's never good when people smirk at panties. Um, <laughs> Ali, instant reaction there, please. Uh, I thought the blurb was terrific. Um, with that, you, you definitely wanted to know what's happening in the story and definitely wanted to read on. And I felt it started well. It was it was a good first couple of lines that, that drew you in. Um, but we then had quite a bit of backstory. You know, we had all the, the lumping of the her getting taken away and foster parents and all that stuff. And I just didn't think we needed that. I think we could have... She's a parkour. She's, you know, about to have her brain taken over. There's lots of excitement. And I think we could have started with a bit more, a bit more exciting... Um, I like some of the phrase, you know, the fact that parkour was described by the state as um, self-destructive behaviour. You know, yeah, that, that right. struck me. It's probably um, true, actually, now, probably. <laughs> probably um. true. Um, and there was a fair bit of telling, not showing. Um, so, and I think that could have been tidied up a bit in various ways. But, uh, no, I mean, it is a premise. It's great. I would, I would like to read it. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, Amber? I thought it was good. I liked it. I really liked the first paragraph, although it, at one point I, I occurred, he sounded, the, the character sounded like a cynical man at one point, and then I realized, mm. no, it's a girl. But I did like it. I really love, I really find parkour interesting. So yeah. I would have liked to have seen more parkour, too. Okay. Um. All right, so um, let me give you my reaction, and then we can talk. Um, I, um, I, I, I agree. I mean, it's quite interesting how uh, you know people do uh, very often end up agreeing <clears throat> on on pop up submissions. Um, and why is that? Is it because we have a sort of weak willed, independent um, people who have no sense of their own opinions? Not at all, actually. What it, what it means is that actually what you are looking for is general agreement if you are trying to get a book going. And, you know, you've got maybe seven or eight key people who you've all got to make feel the same way um, when you pitch something. Um, so, yes, parkour, very good. Katie and the Jeremy's got it right at last. Parkour is actually quite an integral part in my experience, at least. My fairly limited experience, but intense experience of video games, many of the games that I play and have played, possibly excessively, uh, definitely excessively dying light 400 hours um, just include parkour as, you know, it's just, it just happens there, it's not a game about parkour it's just one of the features of the game so I tend to think that it doesn't really need that much explanation actually except for people who really don't know what they're talking about in terms of parkour and I think young people do um, I think the, the chat room has been picking up some interesting things you've been seeing on the screen um my feeling is that it's 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 a little bit too kitchen sink at the moment, Rick. I think that there are there are a lot of interesting ingredients there, none of which um, really followed through. Um, I know what you're going to say. 
you're going to say you planted those things there and in due course we're going to open each one of those doors. I know you're going to say that. Um, but... You haven't said it yet. There's a 15 second delay. Um, I, you know, this is, this is... I don't need to, to tell you, who's a veteran of the games industry, that book publishing is very much in competition with YouTube video games. You name it, really. So... We do ask for 700 words for, for a purpose, for a reason. You've got to get it hooked. So my feeling is take your courage in both hands. Find out what really is, the, is potentially the strongest element of maybe half a dozen quite strong elements you've introduced there but not um, pursued. And just go hell for leather with that one and make it work. And that's the sort of emphatic statement that's going to get a publisher's interest. At the moment, it's, you know... As um, uh, Rich has um, pointed out in the chat room, I don't know if it's up there. Uh, no, it's scrolled off now. Um, very interesting element about um, father, drugs, unfair conviction, stuff like that. That's got potential. You've got potential emotional involvement there. What is it that's going to get the average reader, average publisher, and the, remember the publisher is very often not in the demographic to which they're publishing, so that's an added complication. What is it that's really going to get them hooked? If you can do that in the first 700 words, make us, as I always say, an offer that the reader can't refuse, then that's your calling card. Um, so I would have liked to, by all means, open, you know, mention some of these other things, but just go strong on something really irresistible that you know that you know gets us hooked and when and you know when when an author does that because they write with confidence and they you know they just throw it down on the ground and say that's it i know you're going to have to read on and if you make that kind of emphatic statement on the first um, page or two you will definitely get a deal no question about that how do you how do you do that mm, that's an, that's another issue so guys we have to take a view Amber. Near miss. <laughs> near miss, okay. It's um it's a near miss for Amber and for Ali. The same. I will go for a near miss. Okay. I think there's lots of potential and a bit of uh, bit of sorting out would do it. All right. Uh, another way of saying that probably, and this is this uh, of course comes from Katie, and it's the option I'm going to go for is more cowbell, actually. I, w I would want a, m a, a more intense more immediately involving emotional experience in, in the first page or two. It's a tall order, but some people can do it. If you can do it, then you'll be up there with them. Um, I would want more cowbell, as Katie says. You deliver that, then um, you'll be in business, I reckon. Um, thank you very much, Rick. That was great. I hope you found some of the comments interesting. And, of course, the chat room. I, I just think the chat room is amazing, actually. Um, in terms of sort of instant market research, you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong with the pop-up submission chat room. This comes from Katie. Katie Bezwetherick. That's a good name, Katie, if ever there was one. This is children's illustrated fiction. It's called Jake and the Smugglers. Um, the uh, synopsis, no, the blurb, we're calling it a blurb. When Jake visits his aunt at the seaside, his aunt's cat, Bun Bun, who has another life as a coast guard, hey, starts talking to him in rhyme in the middle of the night and carries him on his back to a place called Rotting Dean. Here, they witness the wrecking of a French ship by a gang of cat smugglers, rescue a sailor and discover that Badger, the other coast guard, has been taken hostage. Jake and Bun-Bun will need to work together to rescue Badger, avoid a watery grave, and defeat the cat smugglers. And I think we can show, since this is an illustrated book, I can show you a little bit of the art that uh, Katie's done. That's the, the front cover. Jake and the smugglers. And um, let me see. Oh, it's Uncle Rich who is going to deliver this. Richly, I say. Richly. Jake and the Smugglers by Katie Bessweatherick. Read by Rich. Chapter 1. Wreckers One day, in midsummer 2013, young Jake, who was eight, came to visit his auntie Katie, who lived far away in a town called Brighthelmston, which was by the sea. 
Jake was a blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy, full of energy and mischief. He was an adventurous type, who liked to try new things, and wasn't afraid of the odd bruise from falling out of trees or off high railings. But he was always asking why, and seemed to be aware of life's mystery. He'd spent a lovely, sunny day by the rock pools with his auntie Katie, fishing for crabs and starfish, and he'd had his tea and was off to bed. He felt very sleepy, and his auntie had read him a story all about smugglers. One of them was called Dr Hooker, who was a vicar, and had stolen a lot of money from some French men. Jake drifted off to sleep in no time. But as was usually the case, it wasn't long before Jake was wide awake and downstairs after a glass of cold milk from the fridge. He heard a crunching sound, and it was Bun-Bun, his auntie's cat, noshing on cat biscuits. Jake stroked this fine animal that was a beautiful black and white, and as his fingers slipped through his thick, soft fur, to his surprise, through purrs, the cat spoke to him in a very soft, deep, velvety voice, sounding like an old movie star. Hmm, I do rather like to be stroked. Do you know, I feel like a stroll on a knoll over the hill and below to where my friendlings live. Would you very much care to come with? I haven't much time to waste. There are things to do and be done. We must make haste. It's a long way for a little boy like you, but you can ride on my back for a minute or two. Oh, I'd love to come, said Jake. But where are we going? You'll see when we arrive. Oh, the unknown makes us feel alive. The name counts not a bean, but if you really want to know, the place is called Rotting Dean. So Jake and Bun Bun walked off into the night. It was a balmy night, and there was a full moon to light the way over the downs to Rotting Dean. It wasn't long before Jake felt rather weary of walking. Most of it seemed uphill, and he wasn't in the mood for that, having just had his tonsils out. Climb up, dear boy. I'm not a toy to be broken, said Bun Bun, becoming bigger and bigger under the strength of the moon's rays. And Bun Bun really did seem to grow much taller than Jake, so that Jake had to climb up Bun Bun by holding on to his fur. Bun Bun's fur was very thick and long, but rather silky, so that Jake had to use his feet to get a grip. Once atop of Bun Bun, Jake held on to Bun Bun's collar, and then off they rode. During the journey, Bun Bun told Jake that he was a coast guard by night, and that he had to be on the lookout for ships in trouble so that he could help them. Bun Bun told him that the place that they were going to was called Badger's Watch. But that's my middle name, said Jake. And so it is. But you see, we've been waiting for you, said Bun Bun mysteriously. They walked for some time over hills and through fields of green unripened corn, blown by a breeze that made it rustle. The moon lit the chalky downland path ahead like a friend leading the way, and sometimes touched the poppy heads, which were plentiful. They walked past an old farm, through fields of cows which came closer to look curiously at this odd pair, and finally they saw the village of Rotting Dean below them as they reached the old black windmill. The breeze had turned into a gale, and the windmill's sails turned and whirred quite violently from the strength of the wind. Just a little further, and we'll be there, said Bun Bun. Right, so I'm very curious to know what you make of this, Amber, because that was quite, I thought that was quite English, actually. So how much of that did you understand? Oh, enough. I was really amused by the rhyming and stuff. And, You're a Bun Bun fan fan. I guess. I, I, I think I'm starting to like children's books again. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was really amused. I was I was amused by the fact that um, Badgers, are there a lot of places in the UK named Badgers? Because I watch Midsummer. In Midsummer Murders, like everything's mad. Badgers drift, Badgers this, Badgers that. Oh, really? That. How interesting. Because well, my, my last like house was called Badgers Hole, actually. Oh, so, yeah, I, I mean, badgers. I never inquired which particular hole, of course. But, um, yeah, Badgers Hole. <laughs> and um, 
I think a lot of places are actually. We've yeah, got a soft spot I, I for like badges it. here, but we do go out shooting them as well. I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the the reading and and um, at one point, uh, Rich, you know, transversed one of the sentences and and he he improved it. But you know, there weren't a lot of there weren't a lot of mis you know bad wordings to begin with. But yeah, I thought that was funny too. And the illustration was really good. It was I, nice. I thought it? it was really, yeah. Yeah. really colorful and yeah, with clean lines and yeah. had had some personality. Okay, um, I should tell you about uh, Katie. Uh, she's a teacher. She taught art, photography, and English in adult ed education in secondary schools. She's also a rock climber. You like adventurous, traditional, multi pitches? Not sure what that is, but it sounds very dangerous, Katie. Um, I've written screenplays. She says one of which is made into a short film. And before being a teacher, you worked for the national and local press as a photojournalist. So you've been around, lots of good experience there. Ali, how, how, how did that make you feel? <laughs> well, I thought, I mean, it was a lovely, gentle story. And, you know, I, I like the premise. It sounds like it should be fun. Um, uh, I, I felt there was quite a lot of telling rather than showing, um, yeah. particularly in a children's book. Um, and things like um, Bun Bun told him blah 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 you know why was that not presented mm. in dialogue why didn't mm. bum bum just say yeah. it actually yeah. um i think also it was inconsistent i mean it talked at one point about uh, was it sorry jake jake um being aware of life's mysteries now i think that's a slightly odd concept to toss in when you're about to then say he went off to bed and had a lovely glass of milk so it's just the consistency of, of <laughs> oh yes the poppy heads were plentiful again it, do, it doesn't seem like a, a phrase from a child's books yeah. um and yeah. you know again certain things are drawn out you know there's a bit too much about the windmill i think child yeah. probably just needed to know there's a windmill and it was going around rather a lot um so you know i think it was quite fun um and a good premise, but I think it didn't quite speak to consistently to the children as perhaps it should have done. So I love the, the illustrations. I agree. I thought they were very yeah. charming, very pretty. Um, so Katie, Katie just says in the chat room, um, fantastic beasts. I think she's talking about badges, not ours. Um, but they sometimes kill lambs, a shepherd told me, says Katie. Um, which is very disturbing. I mean, I don't know if that's true. Might be a vicious rumor put around by weasels or something. I don't know. I would like, I don't like know. to think that badgers don't do that. <laughs> anyone, I don't know. Anyone confirm this think, nasty, vile rumour about badgers? I think they get TB. That's about the only thing I know about badgers. Oh, no, I think that's highly controversial, actually, whether they do or not. Or whether <laughs> they like transfer it. Or whether, you. possibly, they maybe, actually catch it from maybe cows. Maybe rabies. Possibly uh -huh. rabies. Do, do you have badgers? Do you have badgers in America and Texas? Have, I suppose the biggest badgers in the world would come from Texas, I suppose. Uh, I guess so. I, I, you know, I haven't, I haven't seen a badger, but I haven't seen an armadillo either. So hmm. they may be here. <laughs> they get the I plague, don't they? Know. So nothing is safe, really. Badgers are on, from badgers to armadillo. Um, I am. Um, got I, badger rodeos. Badger rodeos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have chickens next door, and that's very strange. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, that's brought everything research. to a full stop now, hasn't it, really? <laughs> and it's got chickens next door. <laughs> Don't suppose anything will grow on that land, will it? Anyway, um, okay, so I, um, I had a number of reactions to this. Um, first thing made me think of, for no particular... Well, I can't think of why exactly. By the way, Richard's reading was fabulous. Um, made me think of Katie Morag. Anybody know Katie Morag? Getting complete blank looks. Wonderful series yep. of books. Um, classic books, really. Fairly, fairly modern. About a little girl who lives on a uh, Scottish island. And just her, her adventures, really. Nothing particularly out of the norm, out of the usual. But the Katie Moore series of books, God, I'm not sure if the author illustrated them. Not sure. Beautiful illustrated. I think the watercolors. Uh, and kids just love them. Young kids, and somebody was talking in the chat room earlier, I think Nikki, about how the market segments, and it definitely does at that age very much so, sometimes to six months or so. Um, Katie Morag, you might want to check the Katie Morag series out, Katie, because I think that's an exercise in simplicity. Might, might set you thinking. Another reaction was... Um, 
I rather like the way you handle the magic. It set me in mind of um, John Maysfield, the way that he treats magic as just normal, just part of life, and he, you know, it happens and there you go. And one moment, normal, next moment, on the back of a cat. Um, I like that. It's very straightforward, and I, I thought you did that really well. Um, I'm not a big fan of Bun Bun, actually. I don't like the name much. I don't, don't don't like the fact that he speaks in rhyming couplets all the time. Now, see, maybe maybe your readers would actually, but I don't. I think that's going to be irritating after a while. You might even find find it starts to di- dictate the way the plot goes because you can't find anything to r- rhyme with n- rotting Dean or something. Um, so split feelings about little Bun Bun. I felt it was a bit too cute actually. And I thought Rich did manfully well making Bun Bun into sort of Peter O'Toole character, but I don't know, just something about that didn't ring true to me. Um, so I've got reservations about that. Um, what you're trying to do is very, very challenging. Um, you're shooting for the stars with, with this sort of thing, with an illustrator who also writes, or an author who also illustrates. Um, if you succeed in doing that, you will find publishers will worship you and you may well have a meal ticket for the rest of your life because that's the way it tends to go with writers who illustrate their own work. Um, they tend to become cults, actually, and I can think of quite a few examples of that. Um, but if, you, if one of those two aspects is stronger than the other, then the weak one is constantly going to let you down and that's a problem. So you need to think quite carefully about that. Um, but basically, I mean, it's enjoyable, very enjoyable. So, guys, what are we going to say? Amber. A near miss again. Another near miss. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And Ali. Um, I think again a near miss. Um, certainly with the rhyming, I think the cadence was out for quite a lot of it, and of course there is always the problem with translation rights, isn't there? Um, and I think. I think there were enough inconsistencies. Yeah. That's yeah. a challenge for um, a translator, isn't it, yeah. actually? I mean, sometimes you might have to uh, alter the story, I suppose, quite radically. Or just they do them, wonder whether it, I'll just drop the rhyme. It does strike mm-hmm. me as being possibly. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I'll go for Nemeth. Um, very good point you just raised there, Ali, actually, about translation. Um, illustrated books are famously expensive for uh, publishers to, to produce, and also very long as well, actually. It can take years to put together, even you know, quite a simple-looking um, project. Um, and because the, the costs are high, it is important, and I think this is something that writers should consider when getting into this area. It is important that your book has international potential. Um, how do you assess that? Well, it's obviously highly subjective. But, you know, you've got to be able to make a good case um, that the book will sell into a number of key foreign markets, most important foreign markets, notably being North America, of course, um, Japan, Germany, places like that. Yeah, so for me, it'll be a, a, a near miss as well. Um, but I thoroughly enjoyed it and thoroughly enjoyed Rich's reading. <laughs> Another good title here. We've had several really good titles, actually, in this show, haven't we? This is Lost Ways by uh, Kieran McDonnell. And it's contemporary. Probably need to use this spell checker there a little bit more, Kieran. Fiction drama. Darkish comedy. <laughs> Which I'm not sure if that's a genre, but anyway, it tells us what it's about. Let's have a look at the, the blurb. I believe Lost Ways is a wild story that leads somewhere unexpected and teaches us about the world and its people. It has compelling characters, inimitable voices and a lot of heart. It reveals the complexity of the human heart and is gritty, serious, funny and demonstrates a new, incredible, necessary voice. Well, that would probably be yours, wouldn't it, Kieran? Jimmy catches his abusive girlfriend sleeping with an older man, then moves home to his lone parent, Dad, only to discover his dad is suffering from Alzheimer's. From here, Jimmy leaves, oh dear. And at that point, 
we run out of our 500 characters. And when you do make a submission of pop-up submissions, we count each character in your blurb. Um, and it's it's actually worth spending a, a few months. You don't need to do a character count because it will it will do it automatically on the screen for you. So if, if you if it stops you typing any more than 500 characters, you know you've reached the limit. So do do observe that, please, because otherwise we're not getting a full blurb from you. Um, let me tell you briefly about Kieran. He is an engineering project manager who has completed a creative writing diploma. Um, you live fairly close to Dublin. <clears throat> um, you commute. You've been writing for years, but only recently, for personal reasons, have decided to try and get published. Good idea. I sincerely believe I have something clever and different in the story. And I also believe whether Lost Ways gets published or not, I will produce my second novel by summer uh, 2019. I just love to write. Good spirit. Absolutely right, Kieran. Absolutely right. Um, very much looking forward to this. And it's read one more time with lots of feeling by Emily. Lost Ways, read by Emily. Chapter One. When you die, you go into dust, just like a lump of shite. That's the way it is. John Joe stands tall, sticks out the chest, and holds court as usual. And those funerals are only a load of pure scar as well. I choose not to answer, and I'm no in no mood for the layers of shite talk with any of them. They can all go to fuck. Well, Jimmy, were you at the funeral today? His eyes are bulging as if a giant hand is squeezing his beer gut into submission. No. Did you know him? Only a bit. I stopped rubbing my hands in anticipation of my pint to give him my full attention. Sad old affair, isn't it? It is, John Joe. Girlfriend and little girl left behind. Shocking altogether. I instantly feel bad for not feeling bad. The thing about it is, I'm a small bit sad, but more immersed in my own situation. I'm pretty sure she's at it again. The dirty fucking cunt, gone all into her cold ways like before. Not talking for weeks on end for no reason, dressing for work as if she's going to a wedding, in great form with the whole world except me. John Joe's unkempt beard is at the forefront of every bloody, pointless debate in this kip. He addresses the other founding members of the mahogany philosophy group, known to me as Know All, a man of little information, but a lot of talk about it. Life is only pure torture, an awful racket, and then you're put into a wooden box. Awful shite altogether. Sure he wasn't wearing a seatbelt, what do you expect? As no all starts as usual knowing all about everything, I move away. I've no time for these sorts of conversations, and himself and big John Joe Duffy are starting to eat up. I've often seen a few slaps thrown where things get very nasty, especially with sensitive issues. Surely he had his belt on. John Joe's big, bleary frog's eyes swirl even more. No, she collected him from town where he's having a few pints watching the game. Noel takes a long, stupid sip of his fresh Americano that was made instantly behind the bar. Seemingly his phone rang and he was rooting to get it out of his inside jacket. Even though I've moved away, I pretend to search for my smokes while I listen in. What do you mean, inside jacket? He'd one of them, them puffy sleeveless jackets on over his normal coat. Sure, they're only a cunt of a oak. John Joe's big hand makes the pint glass look like a whiskey glass as he guzzles it, guzzles it down to about halfway. What kind of jacket has no sleeves? Sure, then it's not a jacket, it's only a chest warmer. Anyway, at that exact moment at Donovan's bad bend, a fucking little squirrel ran out and across the road. Noel forces his front teeth over his bottom lip and moves his chin up and down and makes a stupid squirrel sound. The poor girlfriend swerved to avoid the little cunt and lost control and went into the ditch at Donovan's back field. Seemingly, when she hit the ditch, he flew straight out the window, about fifty yards. Put your fucking teeth back into your mouth, you little cunt. God help them. John Joe wipes the bit of forty Guinness from around his mouth, then wipes his hand off the back of his jeans and clenches his fist. Ah, sure, that's life really, isn't it? Timing is everything, isn't it? It's all about the timing, isn't it? No all asks the questions, and once more has all the answers. The stupid prick. Rage courses through my veins listening to him, and then John Joe releases his fist clench when No all hands him a pint. Sickened in their company, and as sad as I don't feel, a public flogging about the poor fellow's demise is in any way worthy. 
I grab my own pint and head for the smoking area in at the back of the entrance of the pub. With a bit of luck, I'll get a bit of peace and quiet away from the mahogany philosophy group. Yeah, the mahogany philosophy group. Interesting. Uh, um, so do you want to hang around with the mahogany philosophy group, Amber? Yeah, I thought it was... I didn't understand everything, but I thought no. it was interesting. I'd want to keep reading to to uh, to find out. To find out, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's um yeah, it's quite immersive, isn't it? Ali, what did you think? Um I didn't like it. I, I felt there was almost two strands in the story. I mean, we're hearing we we know that the girlfriend's up to something and that is probably the more important of the two. Um and yet we're concentrating on the fact that a fellow's dead and we don't really know anything about him and actually mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure we actually care as it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Um the other thing is presumably, you know, the string of expletives was was to yeah. show his anger or, you know, his yeah. I don't know how he felt about the situation. But actually it got very tedious um, and it, it almost feels like the author just simply has an extremely limited vocabulary it was you know I just I found it a bit wearing frankly yeah um, you've got to be careful about that actually let's talk about that in a moment actually I did I did warn everyone about it at the beginning of the show that there were some uh, uh, what do I call it salty language uh, let's talk about that in a moment um, so you so we've got an interesting mixed reaction there you've um, you split our panel right down the middle Kieran um, Amber wants to to turn the page Ali's just is turned off. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think uh, with me though, it's it's mostly that I I am reading it as someone who's not, you know, from there. So uh, to me, it's a representative. If it's not representative, then yeah. then I'm just wrong, you know. I think Kieran, I, Kieran is very lucky actually get Emmy to uh, uh, reading that because you know we we get a lot of the authentic voice there. Um. Yeah, so uh, the C word and stuff like that used to be the F word, but it's the C word that these days. That doesn't bother me. Doesn't bother you. That doesn't bother me at all. Um, but I know I I can see it does some people sometimes. Yeah, that's right, and um, which is okay, you know, makes sense. Uh, you, <laughs> you do get a lot of submissions that have a lot of gratuitous bad language, um, and. You know, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have any effect where you think, oh, just another one, another one. Um, if it works, it works. Mostly, on most submissions, it doesn't. And it's kind of a, a substitute for an authentic voice. Um, and you can, you know, you can see it my way, you think, oh, really, you know, it, it's, you're not fooling me. There's no voice there. Um, and I, I think... As an unsolicited, unsolicited submission, you you do need to be a bit careful about using language like that because you don't know who's going to who's going to be reading it. If it's if it works, if it's essential, if it's part of the um, if it's in the nature of the beast, then that's that's okay. But even so, I would be quite you know judicious really, um, just as a general comment, um, and don't for heaven's sake think that by putting a lot of, you know, expletive deleted in the first line or so, that is immediately going to get you taken seriously and gives you gives you real voice as an author because it doesn't, tends, tends to do the opposite because we've just seen so many submissions that literally don't work like that. So that provides though, I am in Amber's camp. I actually would want to read more. I would actually want to call this in. Um, we haven't got to that stage yet, but I'm telling you now, I would want to call it in with reservations and my reservation, and I, I fear and suspect, especially from the blurb, which I don't think anybody liked, um, is that it probably is a very promising start that then doesn't go anywhere. Um, or at least doesn't go, it probably does more of the same. Um, that would have been my great fear. I don't think there's, there's a, I, I, I suspect, I don't know, but I don't think there's enough plot structure there, um, at least not that I've seen, to, to turn it into a compelling read. But there's certainly a voice, uh, certainly a voice, and I'm always interested in, 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 in writers who can manifest a strong voice. So for that reason alone, I would actually call it in. What would you say in that case, Ali? 
Um, I've uh, well, I guess I mean realistically, it's not like a cup of tea. Um, but I would, I'd, I'd be sort of um, happy to call it a near miss because okay. I do think. I mean, it's a bit like you know, if, if the words were out and they were all, he'd just simply used very or nice all the way through. It would have weakened it just the same. Yeah, that's um, true. That's so, true. You know, you you'd have removed it, whatever it was. But uh, yeah. so, uh, you know, I wouldn't personally wish to read it, but I, I think it could be a nemesis. Yeah, yeah. Okay, nemesis and amber. A near miss. Hmm. Um, I think. Well, is there other options? <laughs> yeah, invent so, um, one. Um, Katie did. Invent Katie one. invented more cow battle. Look where um, it is now. Okay. Well, I wanted more. Okay, I wanted less cowbell, but you didn't. Put, you, if you put less, you want less cowbell, cowbell, cowbell. Uh, explain yourself, madam. <laughs> well, sometimes there's just too much. Well, like the too much cursing. It's like it's trying. It's a little. I, I, I didn't. I wouldn't have counted it here. I think because of the difference in cultures. But I, when you were talking, I realized I do. I do know what you mean. Sometimes mm. it's like the person's trying too hard to. Yeah. To be something like be tough sometimes, or yeah. or be from you know, so, so that's what they would be good for for those situations. So, or yeah. sometimes it's the the language is too flowery or too many, then they put less cowbell. Yeah, know? yeah. Less so purple I, I, prose. I reckon Kieran's <laughs> been been around the block a few times <clears throat> as an engineering project manager and all kinds of other stuff. And he's clearly been inside a pub or two. He knows all about <laughs> the. Uh, Mahogany. I uh, have it, so what do I do? No, of course not, no. Um, they don't have pubs in Texas, do they? Oh, like they have bars, but I don't. It's just not. See, American bars I've are not pubs, are they? Actually, I mean, oh. no, I've been told they're not. I've been, I've been told that they're, they're different, but uh, that the, the bar experience is different from the pub experience. Yeah, but. it is quite. Actually, I mean, you know, pubs are. Pretty much an endangered species in this country as well. Thank you, Weatherspoons. Um, <laughs> yeah, but anyway, um, Kieran, I think you've got a very interesting voice there, and I would definitely want to read more. But I suspect that the structure is not strong enough to sustain a complete manuscript. But I could be wrong, and I would I would want to know. So um, it doesn't happen very often, but I am definitely going to call that in. Thank you very much, Kieran. <laughs> Wow, this is a dragon in the shadows. We've got some knockout titles this show. I think we had several really strong titles. Um, it, this is a commercial title, actually. Is it the most creative title in the world? No. But it's got, it's got that commercial feel to it. So I'm interested. It's by Heather, Heather Keller. And it's fantasy. Not non-fiction, it's fantasy. This is what her, Heather says. For her blurb, sucked into the clan against her will. Autumn Edwards is finally able to escape when her ailing ma master dies. Autumn prays that the ninja will forget her. Unfortunately, ninjas show up at her office. No, sorry. <laughs> Why did I say office? Unfortunately, ninjas show up at her coffee shop to reclaim her. When Autumn's new master mentally bonds with her, he notices a spark. The spark makes him wonder if his unusual student is the answer to an ancient prophecy. He's not the only one noticing Autumn's legendary potential. The Dark Force is also racing to control Autumn's mind. A Dragon in the Shadows, read by Alison Gardner. Yesterday marked the two-year anniversary of her escape. Autumn felt she could finally breathe again. Surely the ninja had forgotten her by now. Autumn remembered how, after she fled Japan, minutes had scraped by at a snail's pace, every moment filled with frantic searching. She constantly scanned for any evidence that the ninja were in pursuit. Her internal radar strained as her eyes scoured shadows for any sign of movement. Nights were even worse. She would huddle in the corner, hands white-knuckled as she clutched her sword to her chest. Sleep came in accidental bursts. All her training was abandoned as she was reduced to nothing but a trembling child. As days lengthened into weeks and weeks into months, she gradually learned to relax. Autumn continued to scan, but she didn't jump at shadows any more. A year ago, Autumn built up enough courage to start working at the local coffee shop on Western Main. With only occasional disruption, she led a very uneventful life. Quiet, 
bland, just like the beige walls around her that brimmed with a soothing scent of roasting coffee beans. Autumn's eyes skimmed around the room, revelling in the warmth and safety of her surrounding space. The muted glow of the overhead lights streamed down onto customers sipping coffee and unfolding newspapers. Hushed clinking sounds could be heard as spoons stirred and cups were lowered onto waiting saucers. Autumn was in the process of filling her current customer's order. She had just pressed the button on the sleek coffee machine in front of her when she felt the ninja's menacing presence. Yesterday's celebration was instantly forgotten. Her eyes drifted eastward towards the airport. As she poured, drops of molten liquid jumped from the surface of the non-fat cappuccino in her shaking hands onto the granite counter below. Barely able to keep the rest of the cup's contents from jiggling over the sides, Autumn called over to her manager, Alyssa, can I take my break now? The bohemian garbed redhead didn't look up from the design she was painting in the foam of the steaming cup in front of her. She hollered back, Sure, no problem, darling. Autumn quickly placed the cappuccino on the counter in front of the waiting coffee junkie. She hurtled down the hallway, through the cinnamon roll scented kitchen, and out to the brick alleyway in the back of the shop. It's okay, it's okay, Autumn quietly told herself as she paced back and forth. Her hands jerked up and down as if she was kneading dough. The ninja aren't here for you. They would have come for you a long time ago. Calm down. Autumn tucked her straying blonde hair behind her ears, then forced herself to take some deep breaths. She concentrated on the rush of air as she drew it in through her nostrils and released it out through her mouth. She forced her shoulders to relax as she repeated the process. In, out, in, out. Autumn's heart slowed a little as the anxiety lowered from her throat to her chest. Her eyes panned, taking the green and blue dumpsters nestled in the red brick wall around her. Stop being ridiculous, Autumn chided herself. She shook her head to clear the rest of the panicked thoughts from her mind. Autumn pulled open the dilapidated metal door at the back of the shop and meandered back down the hallway. Returning to the counter, Autumn scanned around the floor of the coffee shop to see if anyone had noticed her impending meltdown. Its occupants were sprinkled around the shop, methodically stirring and turning pages, clueless to the fact that she had almost lost her mind. A half hour later, the ninja hadn't moved. Autumn peeled the tape from the edges of the boxes she had just unpacked and collapsed the cardboard for recycling. After stacking the flattened containers like pancakes, she clamped her fingers down on them and walked them out back. As the lid on the green dumpster flapped down, Autumn stilled. What were the ninja doing in California? So, she of a thousand voices. Um, <laughs> it's always it's always good, actually, to get the opinion of the person who actually read the piece. So, what did you think then and what do you think now? Um, I think it's a very quiet start to what um, is probably quite an exciting story. You know, if the ninja, I mean, ninja are exciting just by their very nature and they've actually taken over her mind later on, according to the blurb. I didn't know that, of course, when I read it. Um, and But it was a relatively flat start. I, I thought she was a confident writer. You know, I thought it did flow very well. Um, but there were some odd, odd phrases like the walls of the coffee shop brimming with a muted scent. Now, I don't know about walls brimming with scent. Um, and there was, oh, molten liquid. And you sort of think, well, yes, but by definition. So, um, um, and her anxiety lowering from her throat to her chest. Again, it, it, some phrases just seemed a bit sort of oddly put together. Um, but no, I felt it, it flowed very well. And you would want to read on. I would want to read on, find out what happened next. And who was this ninja? Okay, so you would turn the page. I would turn the page. Mm. Yeah, okay. That's great. Um, it, you know, it's so interesting just getting someone's opinion who actually has been inside the manuscript, but not the author. Um, mm. And that, I think that's good. That's that's a good sign, actually, Heather. So you've got uh, at least one thumb up there. Um, let's go to Amber. Reaction, please. Um, yeah, I, I thought there were a lot of things slightly off about the descriptions. I think a few times she even went at a point of view, um, I think. But, and then there's a, I, 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 I find ninjas kind of comical. Maybe it just wasn't for me. Um, ninjas make me want to laugh. <laughs> they just, ninjas make you want to laugh? Do you realize how deadly they are? If I hear yeah, you well. saying that. 
Uh, nowhere. You'll be safe nowhere. <laughs> nowhere. Take it back, I don't, Wilbur. And, and I don't understand the connection between the ninjas and the dragons. And you promised me dragons. Where are my dragons? <laughs> That's right. Yes. You promised me dragons. And all you gave me these filthy ninja. Oh, dear, and a dear. coffee shop. And a coffee shop as well. I, I don't know. So, yeah. I so, like the energy I mean, of the beginning. Did you Did you get into it straight away? It's very, there's lots of attack at the beginning. I thought that was good. What did you think? I thought it had a lot of good, yeah, I did think it had a lot of good stuff at the, um, at, at the beginning. It, it did have, it does have a sort of good rhythm, but, it, but there's things that pulled me out of the story, like some of the wordings of, of the descriptions. So the chat room is, is very busy, as you can see here, um, discussing what walls smell of. What is it you, you started something interesting there, Ali. <laughs> Personally, I, I think it's a long time since I've sniffed a wall, actually. We'll all be doing it tonight. Okay, we will. Ooh, that's a wall. Hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, I like this more than I thought I was going to. Um, I don't want to call it in. Um, after all, it is a bit derivative, dragons and ninjas and stuff. It's not exactly new. Um, I, the thing I liked most is, was the energy of the beginning. I thought that was great, Heather. And, oh, look, I haven't told everyone about you, have I? Let me, let me tell the world about you, Heather. You say, I am a black belt toting, stethoscope-wielding mother of twins. This novel was inspired by my fascination with the ancient Japanese culture and my passion for the martial arts. So, wearing a stethoscope and a, with a black belt, I reckon you bend them, then you mend them. <laughs> so, <laughs> might they only want to find that funny? Probably. Uh, so, um, we need to take a view, which we're going to do now. Ali? I'm going to go for more cowbell. I, I think it did start out well. I like the image of her clutching her sword at night. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we just needed a bit more follow through on that one rather than spending quite a long time in a coffee shop. So um, more cowbell, I reckon. More cowbells, of course, in the chat room. Jeff has just raised the spectre as I thought someone would at some point. Turtles, of course. <laughs> you, say, you say ninja to, uh, to young people these days. The next thing they think about is turtles. Which is not great, is it, <laughs> actually? Not a great association. Laughing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh okay, God. Amber. Uh, not my cup of tea. Not my cup of tea. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say I would have said kind of not my cup of tea, but it, it was actually better than the execution at the beginning. You know, there's something there. Actually, agents and publishers are so optimistic. Really, we see something that we like, and we go, "Oh, that could be really good." Um, possibly unrealistically so, but you know, that's how you you spot goodens, isn't it? Um, so I'm going to go for a near miss, actually. Um, it could be quite quite a pacey ride. So not the most original territory in the world, but, you know, trying to stay one step in front of those pesky ninja could be a good story. Um, thank you very much, Heather. And um, we move on now to our very last submission of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Jerome is in great form. Uh, turtles have definitely inspired them. They're they're turtle crazy. And Rich asks a very good question, actually. If you can fend someone off, can you fend someone on? I feel you should be able to, he says. Good point. This is from Karen. Um, it's the cool breeze of spring, Rebecca's diary. We don't know what the genre is, you didn't tell us, but I'm guessing it's YA. I'm guessing that from the blurb. When 12-year-old Rebecca Riverton finds herself alone in the world, she decides to take her horse flock. We like horse stories here. We think they've got potential. And ride east in the hope of finding other survivors like her. She finds a new home and new friends at Heaver Castle, where she forges a new future for herself as she gains the respect of both humans and aliens. In her diary, Rebecca describes her emotions and adventures as she adapts and flourishes in a new world where prejudices and stereotypes of the past have disappeared. And it's verbally interpreted for us this evening by none other than our own Katie Allen. The Cool Breeze of Spring, Rebecca's Diary, read by Katie Allen. 
Thursday, 12th of September. Dear New Diary, This is your first page and I am so excited. Can you believe it? I feel so grown up now. Today Joan asked me if I'd like to go on a camping trip with the others. Three whole days, just with flock, riding and camping. No teachers and no parents. I'll give Joan my consent form first thing tomorrow morning before school starts. I wish it was next week already. Isn't this a great start of a new diary? The world is just perfect. Friday 13th of September. Oh diary, I'm so mad. They've done it again. They never let me have any fun. What is it with parents? Have they totally forgotten what it's like to be young? I am so mad. I am beyond mad. I am incandescent with rage. If Joan believes that I ride well enough to go, and if she thinks that I'm old enough, then what is their problem? To act like it's the end of the world because I'm a bit younger than the others. I'm 12 and they're 16. So what? Missing three days of school won't kill me. It's boring anyway. Who needs geography, French or art? When I'm older, I want to have something exciting to do with horses. I could work with Joan at the stables or maybe I'll be a vet. Wouldn't that be just perfect? Horses are so much nicer than people. But right now, I am so mad that I don't think I can sleep tonight. I need to think of something that will convince him to allow me to go. Refusing to eat stopped working years ago. And tears usually only went with Dad. But Mum needs to sign that form too, and she couldn't care less when I cry. I already had a tantrum, and that didn't work. Mum just sent me to my room to cool off. Maybe it will help if I show them that I am really grown up now. You know what, diary? I'll cook them breakfast tomorrow morning. Saturday, 14th of September. Dear diary, you really don't want to know. They made me use my pocket money to buy new bacon and eggs. And it took me ages to get that tomato sauce stain out of the dining room carpet. Why are parents so mean? Sunday, 15th of September. Dear diary, my world is falling apart. My parents hate me. My life stinks. I am never going to be happy again. Monday, 16th of September. My dearest diary, why didn't I think of this before? The solution is so simple. All I needed to do was sign the form myself. When I was doodling during history, I thought how easy it would be to copy mum's and dad's signatures. They are really simple. No silly loops or anything like that. Janet does it all the time when she writes her own absence notes for school and no one's ever found her out. So, I practiced for a while and during the break I signed my form and filled it in. I haven't been able to concentrate in any of my classes today. I was so excited. After school I went straight to the stables to give Joan my sand consent slip and she didn't suspect a thing. She just told me that I'd have a marvellous time and she reminded me to pack a change of clothes and some sandwiches and something to drink for the first day. I am going camping with Flock, my dearest diary, and Mum and Dad won't even notice. All I have to do now is pack a bag and sneak it out of the house on Wednesday morning, and by the time my parents find out that I'm gone on Wednesday morning, it will be too late. Tuesday, 17th of September. My dearest diary, just one short night until we go on our camping trip tomorrow morning. Please keep your papery fingers crossed. This afternoon I gave Ellen at the admin office at school a note to say that I'll be absent tomorrow because of an urgent hospital appointment. That note was signed by my parents, of course. Of course, yes. And that was Katie Ellen doing uh, her, her best. A very fine uh, sort of neurotic 12-year-old impression there. Um, now, before it slips off the screen, it's right at the top of the screen, I have to draw your attention to Mark Jones' new literary genre here, Horses and Aliens, which I think could do really well, actually. Yeah, it's the first uh, Horse and Alien book. Um, lots, lots of thoughts about that, but let's come to Amber first. What was your reaction? I, at first, I thought it was really relatable, and I guess it's it it is because I mean, the, if anybody's written a diary, that's kind of what 
when I was a kid, that's how I started it, like, Dear Diary, and I was very excited about the first day, so it was my first entry, you know, so I was very excited, and and so I, I really related to that part, but then it was a little too much like my diaries, which were <clears throat> not much happening. Uh, they weren't really stories. <laughs> um, they were just mostly me being disgruntled. Um, so it was just a little too authentic, <laughs> I think. Oh, that's not a bad thing. It wasn't, so understands yeah, our readers. It wasn't, yeah, it's not all bad, but it's it's not necessarily quite a story yet, I don't think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. But, Ali? Yeah. Um, I think I think a lot of things, actually. I think the diary itself was the wrong vehicle for the story. Um, I think it's almost by nature, it is just going to be rambling on a bit. Um, and, and we didn't really get into the story. There was not really very much happening. Um, the voice wasn't right. I don't think a 12-year-old would speak like that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's quite a lot of things that she said. I mean, I don't think my dearest diary sounds yeah. like a 12-year-old. I think they're much yeah. more likely to go, you, or it's me again, or something. Um, and things like Ellen at the admin office at school, that's an as you know, Bob, you know, the girl knows it's the Ellen at the admin office at yeah. the school. <laughs> the yeah. fact that she happens to record it on the day is just is, is inconsistent. That's true. Um, so basically, I, I think it's the wrong vehicle. I think she started the story in the wrong place. And I don't think the, the voice is as of a 12 year old. So, um, yeah, that's a that's a good observation. I hadn't um, rumbled that, but I think that's true. Um, Bridget Jones was told um, it was all diary entries, but it was it had a certain it had a very conversational style, and there was like something that happened each day. Well, let's talk about this diary thing. I don't know if it continues like that. I've got a vague feeling that the author Karen probably is, would tell us if she was around that it doesn't continue like this. I think a diary style is incredibly limiting actually, to cover a story. And what I'm trying to do is the same as a lot of people in the chat room trying to do, which is sort of marry this thing together. Because you've got, on the one hand, you've got a conf confessional diary, very sort of chatty, very young. I won't say 12, because I think, I think you're right, actually. The voice isn't quite there of a 12-year-old. Um, but it's diary, and fair enough, for a few pages. But then, you know, it's not just one person's point of view. It's just, it's incredibly restricted. It's, it's kind of less than one person's point of view, actually. And could you maintain that for the whole book? Could you maintain readers' interest for the whole book? You've only got a limited number of tricks you can play if you're if you're writing a diary. There was one trick there which didn't totally work. It did a little bit, but it didn't totally. And I would be looking for that sort of thing to work incredibly well. Like tomorrow, I'm going to show them I'm really grown up, and I'm going to cook them this and do that, and that, you know, and they will be so impressed. And that's the setup, and you just know it's going to turn to stone um and you you know you need you need that satisfaction and it does kind of turn to stone but not quite as satisfying as we wanted to want to go oh yes i knew i knew that was going to happen and it's not quite there so you know there are a number of set pieces like that that we would be looking for in 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 a diary construct um you know once you've done a few of those you have to keep repeating them i reckon Unless you suddenly sort of swap point of view and introduce someone else's diary or something. But anyway, I've got a feeling Karen, who I need to tell you about, would possibly say it doesn't continue diary form. Um, Karen says, after living in the Netherlands, Luxembourg and France, I've now settled down in Edenbridge in Kent. I'm a data scientist and an author. And I hate to talk about myself. Well, join the club, Karen. Actually, I'd say probably the majority of authors do. That's why they're authors and not sort of, um, you know, public speakers or something. Um... But that's all right. You've got to sometimes, and you did well. Um, this, let's come back to this diary thing. Um, it's got to be confessional, because that's the thrill. If you imagine yourself, you know, in a room, just by yourself, and there's someone's diary over there, it might be open. Are you going to go and look at it? Yeah, of course you're going to look at it. But this is, you know, can uh, Enormous anticipation. It's, it's the most personal thing you can even you can get access into, really. And you're having a look at it, and oh, was that a noise? I don't get discovered. So it's all you know that heightened thrill of anticipation of looking, of taking a peek inside someone's most intimate thoughts, especially you know someone younger. I mean, most 
extraordinary sort of you know, universe of things going on there. Um, and we've got to feel that. We've got to feel that you know, very intensely. Um, will it sustain? Don't know. Um, things like this do tend to be you know, confessional type things, and this starts off in a confessional way. I can't remember. You may know, Ali, because I think it was British or someone in the chat room might know. You may not know. Uh, but they've been all kinds of um, books like this, that, uh, thongs and snogging and stuff. Oh, yeah. Angus so, thongs and... Yeah. Exactly. So absolutely yeah. gazillions of copies. Unbelievable appetite, this kind of thing. But it's all, it's all trivial, actually. It's very trivial, but, you know, at the time it means something to the reader. Mm. That, I can't quite square that, and I think that's, that's what a number of people in the chat room have been scratching their head about. I can't quite square, square that with the blurb. You know, no. certainly a lot of people were looking forward to aliens. To yeah. A lot of people are uncursed. Yeah. Well, you just um, can't. I mean, you know, if you're in the middle of you know, your planet and everybody on it's been wiped out, not your yeah, planet, correct. but everybody on it's Fantastic. been wiped out, I, I don't it. think you sit there and write a diary, you know. No. <laughs> You know, well, although, like a teenage, on Karen's behalf, I suspect she would say, yeah. yeah, yeah, but this is the setup. This is going to happen later, right? This is my lovely mm. family life. You know, I've got a horse and everything, and then suddenly one day, Exploded. bang. Mm. And I love the image in the blurb, actually, of a, a young girl horse, maybe the whole of civilization has been wiped out, mm. and she's on the horse, and she's riding across the country trying to find it. That's great. You know, there's a movie mm. poster there. It's fabulous. Mm. But I didn't see any of that. I didn't see any of that sort of lyrical poetry. What I got was sort of snogging and thongs and things so i think there's a major disconnect there that i'm scratching my head over and i'm sure karen would say um that you know given another few hundred words it would all become clearer but that yeah you ain't got that well we give you 700 words so amber please take a view mm. more cowbell i guess more cowbell more cowbell more cowbell mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Ali? Uh, I, I think it's more cowbell as well. I think the blurb had plenty of cowbell, um, so. but yeah. the story itself did not. Um, so, yeah, no, I'd, I'd like a bit more cowbell and a little less excuse okay. notes and breakfast. Okay. I'm going to say near miss for me, and that's it's probably quite a large near miss, actually, um, for reasons already explained. But uh, it's it could be my cup of tea. I can see some commercial potential. But it's it ain't there yet. Um, good. All right. So, what we're we going to do now, guys? I think probably we should decide on our favourite. Let me just run through the options we've got uh, for the submission of the week. This will be um, we've got from Louise. Don't keep me waiting. Um, from Rick, we've got Gnosis. Gnosis, of course, Gnosis. From Katie, we've had Jake and the Smugglers, illustrated by Katie as well. I'll show you the, show you the, um, the front cover picture to that. Uh, from Kiron, we had Lost Ways. From Heather, we had a dragon in the shadows. And just now, from Karen, we had the cool breeze of spring, Rebecca's diary. And I'm going to ask you, Amber, which one of those you want to pick? Uh, Gnosis. I would pick Gnosis. Gnosis, that was by Rick. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. And why are you picking that? <laughs> because it had parkour in it. <laughs> because I liked it the best. Fine. Okay. <laughs> Readers don't have to be logical, do they? <clears throat> Anything but. Okay. It had par well done. You pressed a hot button there, Rick, with Amber. And Annie, what are you going to go for? Uh, also Gnosis. I, I thought it had a great um, blurb. It had a good first sentence. Um, mm. It had an interesting premise. So, I mean, there's work to be done, but I, I, I reckon that one. For Illustrator of the Week, it's Katie and Jake and the Dragon. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It was the there's only not one, much competition but it was, on it that was, one. <laughs> exactly, that's right. Um, I am torn. I can understand you going for Gnosis. I think, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of potential in that. But I'm not buying, as an agent, as a hard-nosed agent, even though I'm very optimistic, I'm not buying potential, I'm buying the words on the page. And for me, it is going to be Kieran, actually. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier, I want to call it in. I do have some con concerns about how it develops and the structure of it. But um, I like the words on the page, even though um, it was uh, 
a bit salacious, should we say? Um, so yeah, Lost Ways. I'm going to I'm going to go for that. But guys, you know what? It does not doesn't actually happen very often. But um, I've been outvoted. Usually, <laughs> go the girls. <laughs> I, I know. Usually, um, we are completely uh, unanimous here, but we're not tonight. It's it's two against one, and I have great pleasure, Rick. And saying you are the submission winner of the week, nice. And I know Rick has been around. I don't know if he's still around, because people very often just you know tune in, yeah, their own thing and go, which is a huge mistake. Don't do that, guys. You're going to learn more about. Uh, actually, you are there, Rick. I'm I'm, I'm chiding you, but yeah, I don't mean it. But honestly, don't just tune in for your own submission. Stick around and see. Uh, put yourself in 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 the agent shoes. What's what very come round to this side of the table and start to think like an agent, and when we have publishers on, start to think like a publisher, and that will really help you. But congratulations, Rick, you are our submitter well of the week. Yeah, fantastic, good choice. Um, thank you very much, Amber. Thank you very much, Ali. One hundred thousand voices. Thank you, <laughs> everyone in the chat room. You've been fabulous as always. Absolute fountain of wit, wisdom, and, you know, Absolutely. great insights into writing, actually. Mm. Um, we will be back. <laughs> Uh, fortune and unpleasant accidents and Baker Street permitting. This time next week, six, six o'clock UK time uh, on a Sunday. Watch out for that old daylight, daylight savings things if you're in the States. It might be a bit iffy. You might have to check that. Um, it's been a great show, everyone. Thank you so much. Good night. See you next week. Night-night. Good night. Good <laughs> night.